Okay, as I say, we're beginning our study of the prophet Amos. Now, Amos, as you know, is one of the uh, collection of what's called the minor prophets. Now, they are minor only in length. See, not in importance. So they're called minor. That doesn't mean we footnote them and say they're really not the word of God or not something that's important. They're very powerful. And Amos, I wanted to teach Amos because Amos... uh, I think has much to say to us and is is a very powerful book as you know if you've studied it. Now of course when we study the Old Testament, uh, any scripture we study, but when we study the Old Testament we have to keep in mind Paul's declaration in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17, all scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Now, the English Standard Version has it. All scripture is breathed of God or God breathed, exhaled by God. So when we study the Old Testament, we need to understand that. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, that certain events involving the Israelites in the wilderness, Paul says that these happened to them as an example, but were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. So he points to these things in the Old Testament. He says, these were written for our instruction. Paul says in Romans 15, 4, that whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. You see, so we we have to have that attitude when we study the Old Testament so that we need to expect to hear God's word for us today through what God said by the prophet Amos. And to do that, what we have to do, we have to first hear accurately what Amos was saying to his immediate audience. Amos is prophesying in the 8th century B.C. And we have to, if we're going to hear what is God saying to us today through what he inspired Amos to say to his immediate audience, we have to first hear correctly what is Amos saying to his immediate audience and then we're in a position to take that and hear God's message to us today from what he said through Amos. So that's why I I always spend time at the beginning introducing books, introducing letters, because that's indispensable to hearing correctly what was being said. So I want to talk a little bit this morning about the political and economic background of Amos' day. I want to share some archaeological stuff with you just because I like it. Uh, So we talk a little bit about that. Now, the kingdom of Israel, as you well know, the kingdom of Israel was a united kingdom, but then it divided in 931 BC following the death of Solomon. So you have, first you have a united kingdom. Solomon dies 931, 930 BC. And then the kingdom divides so that you have Israel. You have Israel here, the yellow, that nation to the north. And you have Judah to the south. So the united kingdom divides. Israel is then the kingdom to the north. Judah is the kingdom to the south. And this division was ordained by God as punishment for Solomon's idolatry. And you can see that in 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 to 13. Now, the 8th century BC, this ushered in prosperous times for both of these kingdoms. You see, Jeroboam II, here, Jeroboam II, he ruled Israel from 793 to 753 BC. And there's some wiggle room here on these. He, 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 from 793 to 753. And Isaiah ruled in Judah from 792 to 740 B.C., though some would slide Isaiah a little bit later. But you got 793 to 753 is Jeroboam, king of the north, and Isaiah 792 to 740 B.C. as king of the south. And then Assyria, under this, this ruler, added Nerari, He rules from 810 down to 782. Assyria had vanquished Damascus in 802 B.C. Okay, so what that did, Damascus was a power. I mean, you have Syria or Aram, that nation. And so Adonirari had vanquished Damascus in 802 B.C. So that freed Israel from the domination of Syria because they'd been taken out of the way by the Assyrians. And then the Assyrians themselves, they went into a temporary decline in the first half of the 8th century. So from 800 B.C. down to 750, that first part of the 8th century B.C., 
Assyria goes, itself goes into decline. So we have in 802, we have Aram or Syria kind of taken away as a threat. And then we have Assyria itself going into a decline from 800 to 750. So that kind of creates the context and the circumstances under which Jeroboam II and Uzziah, they brought Israel and Judah to a prominence that was second only to Solomon's golden age. So, so here we have both the king of the north and the king of the south, Jeroboam II and Uzziah. They bring their respective countries to a prominence and to a prosperity that's second only to Solomon's golden age. These kingdoms, they prospered financially. They expanded their borders. Good times were rolling. Now, according to 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, at some point under Jeroboam II's reign, Israel expanded its borders as far as Lebo Hamath to the north, which is about 40 miles north of Damascus, pretty much due east of Byblos. So you see that they, they had really expanded. Uh, they were expanding their borders. They were prospering. They were economically powerful. Uh, and, and I wanted to say a little bit about these kings. Just to, I like the archaeology. I like you to see that these aren't just stories, that this is real history. These are real people. So you can get put into the context uh, and feel what's going on and not just think about, oh, it's just like a literary story. No, this is, this is what's going on. These are real people and what's happening. Here is the bronze cast of the famous Shema seal. Now, this seal mentions Jeroboam II, mentions him by name. The ancient seal, it was a stamp or an engraving of, of a design or an inscription, or it could be both design and inscription, that was set in some kind of hard substance like stone or metal, and it was used to make an impression in something soft like clay or wax. So we have this thing, that, that, this impression or, that's in something hard, or you have that's either a design or an inscription, and you push it into the soft clay or wax, and it functions kind of as a modern signature. You see, so I have that there. A person's unique seal was put on something as a sign of authenticity or ownership. So people had these seals. And if they wanted to seal something, it would be like signing it because this was my unique seal and I would impress it into the clay or wax. So then that would show that I owned it or, or that it was authentically mine. Now this particular seal, this, it's, the original seal was a jasper seal. And it was discovered in excavations at Megiddo in 1904 it was shipped to the Turkish Sultan in Istanbul, and it was never seen again. But fortunately, before they sent it, they made this bronze cast of the seal. And so this, this bronze cast is now in the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem. The seal's about an inch and a half uh, by an inch, roughly. And above the roaring line, you have the seal's uh, owner, and below it, you have his title. It says, Belonging to Shema, Servant of Jeroboam. And judging from this seal, and, and they know the epigraphers, people who this is their world, they, they say that, look, these inscriptions and the lettering here is from the early 8th century B.C. So you have people say, okay, I, that, that's where this is from. This fits. We have not only the reference to Jeroboam, but we have the lettering is the type that we see from that period of time. So you have this, you have this seal now with such a large and beautifully made seal, that this fellow Shema is evidently some kind of high official in the administration of Jeroboam II, but we don't know who he is or what he did. But the fact he has such a seal, uh, you know, he's somebody who's, who's got some altitude. Now here is, here's one of two ancient seals that mention Uzziah. So that's Jeroboam II. We have a seal, an actual seal mentioning Jeroboam. Here we have one of the two seals that mention King Uzziah, now, both of them are of unknown origin, and both of them are in the Louvre Museum in Paris. This is a ring seal that's made of agate. It's a little uh, larger than a half inch by a little less than a half inch. It's got an Egyptian motif to it, and the inscription reads, Belonging to Obiah, servant of Uzziah. So here we have another indication of somebody here is a servant of King Uzziah. Then here's a drawing. That's all I was able to find is a drawing of the other seal, front and back, uh, this is a, a seal's two-sided, a little over three-quarters of an inch by a little less than three-quarters of an inch. And the side with the man carrying the staff has the name Shebaniah. And the other side says, belonging to Shebaniah, servant of Uzziah. So here we have another seal mentioning the king of the southern kingdom, Uzziah. 
So these are real people, real kingdoms, real stuff going on, real history, real life, just like you and I live our lives. Technology is different. They didn't have cell phones and all that stuff, but they are living their lives in these kingdoms. This isn't, you know, fiction. This isn't fairy tale. This is real stuff. Now, Isaiah is also mentioned in, a, in an inscription that dates much later, from 130 B.C. to A.D. 70. So that's centuries after Uzziah died. And here is the inscription. It's part of an antiquities collection at the Russian convent on the Mount of Olives. It was acquired in the 1800s. This inscription says, here were brought the bones of Uzziah, king of Judah, do not open. Now, so from this, it appears that Uzziah's bones were moved to some other place some 600 to 700 years after his death. Perhaps since he was a leopard, maybe somebody felt that his bones were unclean and needed to be moved outside the city of David. We don't know. But here's this inscription from 130 B.C. to A.D. 70, sometime in that time period. Now, you have these kingdoms during Jeroboam II, during, we have, during uh, Uzziah, in the 8th century B.C., the first part of the 8th century B.C., we have Syria pretty much neutralized as a threat so they can expand. And we have, uh, we have the good times rolling. We have the Assyrians kind of going into decline temporarily during the first part. So what do we have? These two kingdoms expand, but unfortunately, as the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, as they grew more economically and militarily powerful, moral decay was eating at their insides. They were prospering. You say, well, how could they do They were prospering. Things were really fine. They were having a lot of money, financial success, military success, economic success. But during this time, Moral decay was eating at their insides. The people became increasingly indifferent to their covenant responsibilities. It was like, hey, and you see, that's the temptation when things are rolling. What need of God? You see, things are really fine. Why think about him? Why think about my covenant responsibilities, how he wants me to live? And they became increasingly indifferent to those responsibilities. And although they clung to certain rituals, See, forms of religion, they engaged in idol worship and they ignored their duties to their fellow man. So they still clung to these rituals in performing certain religious things, but they didn't, they they were engaging in idol worship, which is an affront to the one true God, and they were ceasing to treat their fellow man the way the covenant God calls them. So they're just blowing him off. But they were still going through these certain rituals, and you'll see Amos as powerfully as anybody. That's why when I talk about people say, well, in the Old Testament, you know, there were just about rules and everything. You're going to see Amos as powerfully as anybody say, this makes God sick. Okay? And that's, I mean, he just is, the word comes down and he he tells them that this stuff simply will not, uh, will not do it. This idea that you can somehow placate and please God by offering him tokens of devotion is nonsense. But it's always been nonsense. Okay, it's always been nonsense. Now, here are tablets. I'll show you the tablets in a second. But tablets from this ancient city, if you see, of Ugarit up here. This ancient city, tablets from that city dating from the 14th to the 13th century B.C. So it's earlier than we're talking about. But you have tablets from that city. uh, They were unearthed at Tel Shamra in Syria in the 1920s and 30s. And they, those tablets revealed a great deal about the Canaanite religion, especially their worship of Baal. And we see Baal all over the Old Testament. But we learned some insight into, into that practice and their worship of Baal from these tablets that were found in the 20s and 30s. Just to give you an idea of what's involved in piecing these things together, there's one of the tablets from Ugarit that somebody has to work with and has to understand the language and has to be able to piece these things together. And this is one of the things, see, that are done by scholars. And see, I know that sometimes there is a, there is a uh, reluctance, or, or a, a, what is it? There, there's some kind of rejection of scholars. And, and we depend on them for these kinds of things, you see. So there's no need to sit here and just be knee-jerk against things that are scholarly. Uh, you know, it's just not good. Because they will piece these things together, they understand you guard, and then we will learn from it. Okay, now I understand why that is, because a lot of times scholars go off the deep end and lose their mind. 
And so you have to be careful about it, but uh, a wholesale rejection of it is actually, it's impossible because we're all dependent on them ultimately. You see, as we, we all read English translations. Uh, so I've made that point many times. But uh, here's a steely. It's also, you can pronounce it stila, or sometimes steely. Depends how it's spelled. But it's a freestanding stone slab. This was found in the excavations at Ugarit. And what this is, this is a depiction of Baal. Now, he was thought to be the god of storms. And somehow the, he, he was the god of storms and the controller of the earth's fertility. And here he is, and this is an image of him. And many scholars believe that, that worship of Baal involved ritual prostitution, which were essentially, these were drunken orgies that were used as a means to incite Baal to inseminate the earth. Now, there's some debate about that. But there are many that think that, is, that was a part of Baal worship was since he was the controller of the earth's fertility, the god of storms, that part of the worship of him, we would do this and we would excite him to yield and to inseminate the earth. And so we would have crops and all that. See, he was a god who could be manipulated or moved by external ritual. So if I want Baal to do something, so if we go have this orgy and this frenzy, we can induce him to do what we want. And I think you'll see this creeping into to the religion of Israel. And this idea that I can, without a heart, come and do certain things and I can get God to play my tune. And God says, look, I want this. You say, yes, I want these. I want these things that I've said, but if your heart's not there, it's nonsense. You see, it's nonsense, and you're trying to, you're trying to fool me. Now, this improved economic situation that I've talked about in Israel, this led to a disparity in wealth among the people. So the good times are rolling, and, and what happens is we have disparity. We have some very, very wealthy people, and we have some very, very poor people. Now, you can see evidence of this social revolution in in archaeology where when they've looked at cities in the 10th century and when they've uncovered cities in the 10th century they've looked and they said that they're all houses that are uniform pretty much in size when we get to the 8th century in Israel we see that there are there's a quarter that has magnificent houses and there's a quarter that has just little huddled houses just little kind of shacks is what how we would put it so now you have you you see that the this disparity in wealth is there and the wealthy they not only they not only in Israel as we will see and you know from reading Amos but they not only neglected the poor but they exploited the poor they used the poor to increase their own wealth and this is one of the things that is central to God's ethic that Amos comes at the Israelites about saying you are mistreating the poor and we well so what I mean he says this is horrible this is a terrible thing for you to be exploiting the poor and using your economic situation to exploit the poor and squeeze them and use them and cheat them because you're more powerful than they are. And he just comes after them and he smokes them. But you can see this is all part of the circumstance and the intrusion of this non-ethical or this ritualistic Canaanite religion into Israelite religion probably facilitated that abandonment of Old Testament ethics. It probably helped that. Because as this Canaanite religion that seems more external, more mechanical, as this comes in, I can sit here and convince myself that I can jettison Old Testament ethics, covenant ethics, what God wants me to do, how he wants me to treat people, how he wants me to be loyal only to him. I can do that. But I can satisfy him by just going through these rituals, you see. And Amos has an answer for that. And the answer is wrong, okay, absolutely, completely wrong. Now, the prophet Amos was a shepherd. He was a shepherd from Tekoa, which is here you can see. It, it, Tekoa is this little town down here. It's about 12 miles south of, 12 miles south of Jerusalem. Now, he also tended sycamore trees during certain times of the year and he would have done that in the coastal plain or in the Jordan Valley not in Tekoa because Tekoa has an altitude of about 2,000 feet and these trees only grow up to about a thousand so he's a shepherd and he also tends these sycamore trees 
during certain seasons of the year. You can see that in chapter 7, verse 14. Now, although he's a Judean, you see, he's from the southern kingdom. It seems that he prophesies exclusively in the northern kingdom. So here he is, he's a Judean, but God has called him with a message, particularly a message for the people of Israel. Now, chapter 1, verse 1, it tells us that Amos prophesied when Uzziah was king in the, when, when Uzziah was king in the south and Jeroboam II was king in the north. So this is when he prophesies. So that sets the latest date of Amos' prophecy to 753 B.C. Because he's prophesying when they're both there. Uh, Jeroboam's rulership ends in 753. So he can't be prophesying later than 753. And the conditions of wealth and false security that we're going to see in Israel. Those conditions that are reflected in that book, they seem more consistent with a period in, in the latter part of Jeroboam's reign. So you go back maybe from the mid-60s down to sometime in that window because these conditions look like they better fit the latter part of Jeroboam's reign so we can shrink that down some to maybe 765, 63, down to 753. And then he mentions the earthquake. Now when he said this in the, in the opening verses, when he speaks of the earthquake, it, two years before the earthquake in chapter 1, verse 1, it may be that evidence of that... This was a serious earthquake because centuries later, it's mentioned in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 5, the earthquake during the days of Uzziah. So this was a serious thing. So this is two years before the earthquake, and our archaeologist Yigael Yadin has found evidence of a significant earthquake at a city of Hatzor, and this dates to around 760. So that would put you right in the window, 762 right around there that fits this window. So that's when I think this prophecy is being delivered by Amos. Now the superscription, let's read it. I didn't know if I'd read the whole thing, but I'm going to read at least the beginning here. Chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Everybody knew what he was talking about when, they, when he said the earthquake. He didn't have, everybody knew, oh man, that thing. Okay, so this is, when, this is when this prophecy happened. And he says, and he said, the Lord roars, verse 2, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastors of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers. So you see that when, when the Lord is going to prophesy through Amos you have him roaring and so I, I told Ken I like the picture that he had in, in the promo of the class where he had the, uh, the lion roaring you see and that's a very uh, good uh, sign or indication here well you see the superscription that verse 1 it identifies Amos and the time of his prophecy and then you see this withering effect of God's roar this is a sign of God's impending judgment on Israel you know, lions today, I mean, you know, you, we, of course, I don't go out anywhere near lions are, whether it be in a Jeep or anything. But there are people that go out there, you know, and, we, you know, we have lights, we have cars, we have guns. All of these things make lions, you know, more manageable. But see, at that time, you didn't have any of that. And so, so when you're out walking in a field and you hear a lion roar, you know, we, <laughs> this, is, this is serious business. Because these things eat people. And so this lion here is depicted this ferocious beast. So see, it brings this idea when a lion's roaring, you say, uh-oh. And so here is God portrayed as this roar like, you know, Aslan. You know, this roar that simply withers the mountain, blows away everything. You see, uh-oh. And this is the beginning of the prophecy, so you see what's happening. This is going to be a word of judgment that God is going to deliver through the prophet Amos. And then he begins, he, he, want, he, he opens this. The, the focus of the prophecy is the northern kingdom of Israel, as it said at the very beginning. This is a word toward Israel. But what he does, he opens the prophecy. He's going to circle Israel. See, here's Israel, the target 
But he's going to go and prophesy, first against Aram and Syria, Philistia, Phoenicia, Ammon, Moab, Edom, Judah. You see, all of the nations around Israel. And you can see the people of Israel as the prophet is prophesying against these surrounding foreign nations. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But the lion is circling. You see, the lion is circling. And so we'll look at that, and then the lion comes to Israel. And I got a hunch they're not so happy about that because the rest of the book will be the word of the Lord to the people in Israel. So let's look at it. I'm gonna, I'll read through just the first section here. These oracles against the surrounding nations, they go from verse 3 down to chapter 2, verse 5. He includes all of them, includes Judah. He's circling all of them. But he says in chapter 1, verse 3, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four. Now this idea for three sins, uh, for the sins of X, even for four, three sins of X, three sins of Damascus, three sins of whichever uh, entity he's talking about, even for four. This is just a poetic way of saying these people have committed numerous sins. So he winds all of them he says this about. So he says, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. So I will send fire upon the house of Hazael and it shall devour the strongholds of Ben-Hadad. I will break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Avon and him who holds the scepter of Beth Eden. And the people of Syria shall go into exile to Ker, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they carried into exile a whole people to deliver them to Edom. So I will send fire upon the wall of Gaza and it shall devour her strongholds. I will cut off the inhabitants of Ashdod and him who holds the scepter from Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord God. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four I will not revoke the punishment because they delivered up a whole people to Edom and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. So I will send fire upon the wall of Tyre and it shall devour her strongholds. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and for four I will not revoke the punishment because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity and his anger tore perpetually and he kept his wrath forever. So I will send a fire upon Teman and it shall devour the strongholds of Basra. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the Ammonites and for four I will not revoke the punishment because they have ripped open pregnant women in Gilead that they might enlarge their border. So I will kindle a fire in the wall of Reba and it shall devour her strongholds with shouting on the day of battle, with a tempest in the day of the whirlwind. And their king shall go into exile, and he and his princes together, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because he burned to lime the bones of the king of Edom. So I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the strongholds of Kerioth. And Moab shall die amid uproar, amid shouting and the sound of the trumpet. I will cut off the ruler from its midst and will kill all its princes with him, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his statutes, but their lies have led them astray, those after which their fathers walked. So I will send a fire upon Judah and it shall devour the strongholds of Jerusalem. So here you have this oracle against all of these surrounding nations. And he goes through and he, he talks about them. He speaks first to, of Damascus. You see, Damascus, which represents, I thought I, up here, it represents this nation, Aram or Syria. He speaks about them. It'll be punished for having threshed Gilead with sledges, having iron teeth. Now, Gilead, is, it's a territory on Israel's frontier east of the Jordan River. So what this seems to be talking about is 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 1 to 9. There's a Syrian incursion into Israel, and it's during the reign of King Jehoahaz, and he reigns from 814 down to 798. 
Okay, I've got Amos prophesying 762, so we're some decades before. But that incursion during the reign of Israel's king Jehoahaz is described as making the army of Jehoahaz like the dust at threshing time. Now that metaphor, it seems to refer to, to indicate extreme decimation. You see, extreme decimation when you're, when you're turning them into the dust at threshing time. And it may suggest unusually cruel or inhumane treatment. And God is saying to Syria that for that, I'm going to punish you. You're going to bear this punishment. And this punishment that he, he gives you, that he tells them, this was fulfilled. It was fulfilled in seven, around 732 when Tiglath-Pileser III... Now he's one of the Assyrian kings. Okay, you have a number of them. Tiglath-Pileser III, he's king of Assyria. He took the people of Damascus captive. And you see that in 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 9. Now this, this king, Tiglath-Pileser III, he's sometimes referred to in Scripture as Pul, P-U-L. There are a couple, number of texts you can see that in 2 Kings 15, 19, 1 Chronicles 5, 26. Here's a relief depicting him in victory that was discovered at Nimrud. So here is this character, this ancient Assyrian ruler. There he is. This is a depiction of him. You know, these things are stylized. But that's who he, re that represents him. This is the actual guy here. Now we have Tiglath-Pileser's own account of his victory over Damascus. He writes, he says, 592 towns of the 16 districts of Damascus I destroyed making them look like hills of ruined cities over which the flood had swept. Elsewhere, he speaks of the defeat he inflicted on Rezan, the king of Syria. So here God says to them, listen, fire's coming on you. And you see this being executed in the person of Tiglath-Pileser. We have Gaza, and Gaza and a number of the towns here, they represent Philistia. You have all Ashdod, Ashkelon, they represent the nation of Philistia, and they're going to be punished for selling unnamed communities to Edom as slaves. Now that probably refers to raids against Israel, where they would take Israelites and sell them to the Edomites as slaves, but we can't be sure, because it simply says unnamed communities, uh, they sold them to Edom as slaves. But this was fulfilled over, over a period of years. You see, in, in uh, Gaza, with regard to that specific city of Gaza in 734, Tiglath-Pileser III, he conquered Gaza. He forced its king, a man named Hanno, he forced him to flee Egypt, and he placed his gods in his own image there in the town and said, these are now your gods. And he did that to them, declared they're the gods of, of the Philistines. And after Tiglath-Pileser dies in 727, Hanno returns and he leads a rebellion against Assyrian control. And then Sargon II, another Assyrian ruler. Sargon II, the one who's ruling when, when uh, you have the assault on Israel. But he, Sargon II, he comes and recaptures Gaza and he took Hanno captive. So here you have this idea saying this is going to be military action is coming against you in response to this. And you see this happening historically. Here is a relief you see this. This is a relief of Sargon. Uh, he's welcoming a high official. He's the one on the right holding the staff and with the different hat. But here's that, you know, and I just show you these things again because I like to, for you to feel the, the reality of this. These are actual people, actually ruled, actually killed many, many people. And there we have uncovered uh, these reliefs and this kind of thing. This is from a his massive palace. This was uncovered at his massive palace in Corsabad. Now that palace was discovered in 1843 after many years of people saying that Sargon was fictional. They said Sargon was fictional because the only place he was referred to in ancient history was in Isaiah chapter 20 verse 1. They didn't find any corroboration elsewhere and so you had people in one of the editions of the Encyclopedia Britannica describing him as fictional and then in 1843 what do you know? We discover his palace. We discover his palace. So now he's one of the best known Assyrian kings. And here's one of the, th this is decorating his palace. These human winged bulls are outside the gateway to his palace. They're 14 feet high. And so here he is. This is one of these, these characters that you have there. And over a century after that, Gaza was later captured by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. 
Its king was deported to Babylon. And here's an image of Nebuchadnezzar. That was the best I could find. This is Nebuchadnezzar here. And this, is, this image is, is from the Tower of Babel Stele. Now Ashdod, we get back to Ashdod, still in Philistia. Ashdod in 720, uh, 720 B.C., Sargon II, he subjugates Ashdod. I just want you to see how God fulfilled these things that he said. You see, in 720, Sargon subjugated Ashdod and he stole one of, its, uh, one of his people as its ruler, as its officer. And then in 711, Ashdod rebels and deposes that ruler. And then Sargon severely punished the city for that revolt. And all of this you can see documented, and I've got uh, citations for it. But this, this assault of Sargon's is referred to in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1. When he comes in after this rebellion and he puts down this revolt and severely punishes the city. A century or so later, Jeremiah refers to the remnant of Ashdod. In Jeremiah 25, verse 20, and Zephaniah still spoke of its desolation in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 4. So what happened to Ashdod? Well, Ashdod was punished. <laughs> It was punished militarily. Ashkelon, 734, Tiglath-Pileser III, he conquered Ashkelon. 701 B.C., Sennacherib, another Assyrian ruler. He again conquered the city, deported its king and his entire family. So all of these are military. When he says, I'll bring fire on the gate, all of these things are military conquests. This uh, uh, Ashkelon remains under Assyrian control until the, until the decay of that empire. And in later years, it was overrun. Later years, it was overrun by Scythians, Babylonians, and then Persians. So here you see that with regard to Ashkelon. Ekron, it may have been under Assyrian domination earlier than this, but Ekron is specifically mentioned among the cities that were conquered by Sargon II in 711. In 701, they rebel against Assyrian rule, were quickly subdued by Sennacherib who's another Assyrian ruler, and the leaders of the rebellion, they were impaled on stakes outside the city. And their supporters were all exiled. So this is what, this is what winds up happening to Ekron. Ekron paid tribute to later Assyrian kings, and its fate during the Babylonian and Persian empires isn't known. Tyre. And we see Tyre in verses 9 and 10. Tyre now is, is representing Phoenicia. You see, so we've had Aram, Syria, Philistia. Now we're up to Phoenicia. It'll be punished for enslaving communities in disregard of a treaty of brotherhood. That's not exactly clear what this is referring to. It may refer to the treaty between uh, Hiram of Tyre and Solomon. Remember, there was a treaty there. That would, be, that would go back before the division of Israel and Judah. But they had, a, they had a treaty. Or it could refer just to the generally amicable relations that existed between Tyre and Israel. But somehow, this idea that they treated people inconsistently with their relationship that they were friends treaty partners and they betrayed them and so here he says that they'll be punished for enslaving communities in disregard of a treaty of brotherhood Tiglath Pileser he collected tribute from Tyre uh, during Esarhaddon's reign Esarhaddon is another Assyrian ruler he reigned from 681 down to 669 during that time the king of Tyre he managed to hold on to his throne by signing a treaty of vassalage, that means basically, I'll be your dog. You can do anything you want to with me, and he signs, okay. And we've uncovered that treaty. So, you know, we have that actual treaty that was signed by the king of Tyre saying, basically, I'm yours. And that happened there in, in, in uh, uh, so we have the Esarhaddon, though, he besieges the city in 761. Uh, Asher Banipal, another Assyrian, he besieges the city in, in 663 B.C., Tyre was only able to hold on to its autonomy by, by having a, a f paying formal homage to these kings. So basically it says, you know, I'll just give up absolutely everything. And the city was greatly weakened by a 13-year siege by Nebuchadnezzar. And then it winds up, ultimately it's destroyed by Alexander the Great. So let me show you just a quick picture here. Here is Esarhaddon, since I mentioned him. Uh, one of these Assyrian kings. You see his vassals and all this bowing before him. And you have him there, and then, and then here is Ashurbanipal. Again, a stylized depiction of this Assyrian ruler that, uh, that you have here. Edom in verses 11 and 12, we talk about the nation here. Let me get back to there. You see down here, Edom. So there, Edom is addressed in 11, verses 11 and 12. It'll be punished for pursuing his brother with a sword. You know, Edomites were descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother. 
Okay, so they had a long history. They had a long history of hostility toward Israel. And the offense here and what they're going to be punished for is pursuing his brother with a sword. And that played out and Edom wound up paying tribute to Tiglath Pileser beginning about 732 B.C., so about 30 years after Amos delivers this. And he pays tribute to a succession of Assyrian kings. And the city was destroyed by the Babylonians in the 6th century B.C. And it was later overrun by the Nabataeans. So, you know, I could have skipped all this stuff, but I want you to see that when God says something to somebody, that it plays out. Now we say, well, why did he take 30 years? You can ask God. You see? God does things his way. He says, I'm over here, I'm bringing these people up. Why don't you just smoke them like you did Sodom and Gomorrah? He, I could do that. But listen, you're going to have to leave this to me. <laughs> you see, you're going to just have to leave this to me. I'm doing something here. If you were me, you see, you'd be doing it differently. But you're not. And so just, just watch, I'm doing something. There may be other things I'm doing by stirring them up. Come over here and you see, I'm God. <laughs> So, you know, I mean, these questions come to us, but I just, that's why I'm going through this. I just want, I'm racing through it, but I want you at least to see how these things wind up being, uh, how they wind up playing out. Ammon in verses 13 to 15. You see, we have this nation here, Ammon, is addressed in verses 13 to 15. It'll be punished for ripping open pregnant women of Gilead to enlarge their borders. Now, this apparently took place during one of their attempts to enlarge their borders at Israel's expense. He refers to the women of Gilead. And so he says, you're going to be punished for ripping open these pregnant women because this is heinous. This is horrible. That you in warfare would go and rip open the stomachs. And, you know, this is just like brutal. This is beyond the bounds of, can I say, civilized warfare? You see, is there such a thing? But see, this idea, so he says, you're going to be, you're going to be punished for this. Now, Reb is the, is the capital of ancient Ammon. It's the modern city of Ammon, Jordan. It's the modern city of Ammon, Jordan. Now, Ammon paid tribute to the Assyrian kings from Tiglath-Pileser, at least through Esarhaddon. So basically, he was a, a vassal. And after the fall of Jerusalem in 587 or 586, Nebuchadnezzar sacked Reb and took large numbers of its citizens captive. Then we have Moab being addressed. Moab, this nation down here, right here. Moab being addressed in, verse, in chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. It says, it'll be punished for desecrating the corpse or the bones of the king of Edom. We would not think anything about that. But this was serious business, to desecrate a corpse and take his bones and scatter them out. And another thing you see, by the way, you see how God, and this in particular here, He's talking about the bones of the king of Edom. Some people say, well, this took place at a certain time during the alliance of Israel and Judah and Edom trying to su suppress an uprising by Moab. We're not told when it took place. But it is something that is offensive to God, the desecration of this, this king's bones, and it's dealing with the, kings of, the king of Moab. Okay, the king of Moab, where he sits here and he says, he says look, you're, you're going to be punished for desecrating the, the, the bones of the king of Edom. Okay, so we have these guys. Moab is, is getting punished for desecrating. And I just thought about, you know, I understand that the church is not a nation. You see, I don't equate the church with America or any other country. You see, the church is like we are everywhere. See, we are not a nation. But do you see that God does care about how nations live and act? You see, I mean, he does care. He is God of all. He is sovereign. And in fact, Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace or a reproach to any people. You see, so what are these people doing? They're living this way, and God says, I'm aware of it. You see, I'm aware of it, and I will exact punishment for it. And you see him doing that. Now, we're gonna, we'll, we'll look at Judah next, and then we'll launch into the body, really, of the prophecy which is what Amos has to say after they're sitting here amening all these things of all these around and then he turns to Israel and he says the Lord has a lot to say to you okay thanks for coming